Luke chapter 1, verses 5 through 17. Please, I, I ask you to just picture the whole scene as I read it. It says, In the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah, who belonged to the priestly division of Abia. His wife Elizabeth was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were upright in the sight of the Lord, observing all the Lord's commandments and regulations blamelessly. But they had no children, because Elizabeth was barren, and they were both well along in years. Once, when Zechariah's division was on duty and he was serving as priest before God, he was chosen by lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to go into the temple of the Lord and to burn incense. And when the time came for the burning of incense, uh, all the assembled worshipers were praying outside. Now, let me stop here just long enough to tell you a little bit of what's happening. There were so many priests at this point in the nation of Israel in Herod's temple that maybe only one time in your life would the lot ever fall to you to be able to go and do what you have been trained all your life to do that you'd be able to be the one to kindle the incense on the altar of incense there before the Holy of Holies behind that heavy veil. So you're standing just this side of it. And there would be a group of uh, people of God gathered out on the temple grounds that were waiting for the blessing. So they were already out there. They believed that whatever was being prayed at that altar, whatever was being spoken by that priest as he kindled uh, those coals before God and caused that fragrance to go up into the heavenlies, that they could stand out there on those grounds and they could say, so be it, Lord. And that whatever would come as a blessing from that prayer at the altar would also somehow come to them as a corporate blessing with individual consequences. So they were standing out there just waiting for their blessing. So probably this is the only time in the man's life he's gotten the chance to do this. And it's already told us he was well along in years. So at this point, he's waited all of his life for his big moment. And I want you to imagine it. So this is the day in verse 11 that then an angel of the Lord appeared to him standing at the right side of the altar of incense. Something I love about the way Luke writes is that he's very, very attentive to detail. So when you're picturing this whole scene, we have a Zechariah coming in, an old man, picture him in his robes. He's kindling uh, the, the um, coals on the altar of incense, standing before it, and then there appears to him an angel. Now, here's what you need to understand, because after he kindled the coals of the altar, he would have gone down to his knees or perhaps even face down, as some of the commentators explain it, before God to bring that intercession. So I want you to picture that it's probably when he is looking up, maybe he started at the angel's feet and it went to the hem of his robe and then up and up and up and up until he saw the radiance of his face. It says then in verse 13, But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you will give him the name John, and he will be a joy and delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth. For he will be great. Imagine this being said to you about a child that you will have. He will be a joy and delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth. For he will be great in the sight of of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from birth. In other words, there was going to be a powerful influence on him that he did not want anyone else to confuse with wine, with anything, any kind of a substance that could cause something to take over a person. He wanted it to be obvious that the only thing filling this man and empowering this man was the Holy Spirit of the living God. Verse 17, and he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. And everything we're talking about in this present series is making ready for a fresh encounter with the Lord, the kind of thing that changes everything. I wonder when was the last time you had such an undeniable encounter that life just could not possibly go back to normal. 
that you had, because of God himself, a brand new normal. That's what I'm talking about here, preparing a way for the Lord. And I, I want to give you a series of four points that we're going to put together through this emphasis on prayer out of Luke chapter 1. And it begins with this right here, number one, be open to a fresh encounter. Be open to a fresh encounter. Jot it down. What was that point? Be open, be open to a fresh encounter. Because let me tell you something that I have learned just from living and from many, many years of ministry. I have found along the way that the people that are less likely to have the fresh encounter, that thing happen that changes the entire uh, aspect of normal, of life as you know it, it's going to less often happen to someone who has had a long history with God than someone who is brand new to the whole thing. Because their eyes are like, oh, I mean like, they are astonished by the least little thing. But I, I want us all, whether we're new to the thing or whether we've been seasoned in it for many, many years, we need a fresh encounter. We need to let God do a brand new thing in us. We want to be part of an adventure. And God is all about taking you on an adventure. But what can happen is we figure out how we want it and we don't want anything to change it. One of the traps that we fall into as Bible students is that we figure out what we believe and then we only read books that affirm what we already believe to be so. And for some of us, we haven't had a real, a real live new idea come to us from the revelation of scripture in 10 solid years because we we got comfortable with our doctrine years back and we decided that's all i want to know that's all i need to know and so every one of our books are about the same thing instead of letting god i mean this is a this is a whole lot of book right here i thought everybody say a lot of bible <laughs> this is right here is a lot of bible he's got a lot to teach us and one of the ways you know you're growing is if you realize somewhere along the way that you were wrong about what you used to think. When was the last time I mean, that he continued to speak such a fresh word over you that you realized that that thing that you thought may be even that thing that you taught wasn't even right? I mean, every now and then I've gone, what? okay, what, what is that scripture doing there? Like that really, that messes with my theology as I know it. I don't need you to be there. That's what I don't need. I don't need you to be there. Every now and then in my reading, I'll be preparing for something, and I'll know what I want to say before I ever go to the Scriptures. And then I go to get Scripture to reaffirm it to me, and then I run into something that turns everything upside down. And suddenly, even if it messed me up, it's a beautiful, beautiful experience. That fresh word from God, that fresh encounter that changes everything. we got to be open to a fresh encounter. And I've got to tell you something. One of the things the scripture goes out of its way to tell us about Elizabeth and Zechariah is that they were a people who had lived with a ton of disappointment. And these were blameless people. We're told explicitly in scripture that they had lived righteously. And yet Elizabeth was barren. Talk about it being someone's fault. I mean, it was her she, she could not bear a child, and they lived with all this profound disappointment. I'm going to tell you something. This is not true of Elizabeth and Zechariah on this page in and, and Luke 1, but it can be true of us. I, I've come to believe that you and I can get a stronghold of disappointment. I mean, we can just always expect it's not going to work out. It's not going to work out. Oh, well, I could have known it was going to happen that way. I should have known it would all fall apart. I knew this was too good to be true. Well, we get a stronghold of disappointment. In fact, we get our identity out of disappointment. Well, I mean, we're wrapped the whole family up in our disappointment. Where we're constantly, there's no meal good enough. There's no movie good enough. There's no friendship good enough. I, I, I had to tell a young uh, mentee, a, a young woman that I was mentoring one time that was disappointed in relationship after relationship. And the only reason I knew this is because I saw myself in her. I said, you know, you put so much pressure on a relationship, nobody can live up. And so we get a stronghold of disappointment. 
What if you began to believe like a, uh, like a watchman on the wall? What if you placed your hope and your expectation in God? He's about to do something new. He is about to do something new. I pray that today, even in us going through this lesson together, that you'll get the sense on you. I pray that this is what God came to work, that you'll get that sense in your heart. God is preparing me for a fresh work. Something is about to happen, something brand new. We've got to be open to it. We got to be open to it. Number one was what? Be open to a fresh we got to be open to a fresh encounter, open to something brand new. Number two, we got to bring our disappointment to the altar. Bring our disappointment to that very altar. I don't know where we got into this habit, but I think it is nearly across the board in, in church circles. Somehow, certainly in my upbringing, the whole idea was put your troubles to the side and go to church. Okay, well, help me with that. I mean, like, so then we're going to get back in the car and there they are again. And, and we turn back into that other really scary family as soon as we leave church. But while we're there, uh, we're, we're this religious family, and we've got it all together. But we we've systematically, we thought it through. We're going Now, we're going to leave our problems behind, and we're going to go to church. Instead of we're going to lay our problems right there on the open page. Girlfriend and guy friend, every time you open the scriptures, you just lay your problem right on it, right on it. Because God's going to speak to you in your very season. It's, it's not a coincidence. If you hear something today that speaks right into the place that you are, that's not you making too much of it. We'll never make too much of it. It's not a coincidence. It's Christ speaking into our ordeal. I want to pitch back out to you that this was a day just like any other day in the life of the Israelites. There had been 400 years of silence. 400 years. What would make today different from any other day? But that day when that man came in that place and stood at that altar, the mouth of God opened again through the angel Gabriel. I mean, try to fathom. Somebody had been in it the day before, the day before that, the day before that, the day before that. All of these years of silence and suddenly God opened opened his mouth to prepare a place for the Lord. And he says in verse 13, I just think this is amazing. Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. I want to pause here and talk this through for a second. Don't be afraid. Well, of course, there's first of all the fear of what he had seen. Do you know that Daniel also saw Gabriel and it terrified him so much he was nearly physically ill? So this is the same angel we have standing uh, before Zechariah. So he's seeing the same kind of sight. And so Gabriel says, don't be afraid. And I know that that's what it means, don't be afraid of this sight. But I thought also about a deeper kind of very personal fear, that fear that our prayers are not being heard. That, that fear that it's working for somebody else, but it's just not working for us. That, that kind of fear... And I want you to see with me what just blows my mind here is he said, your prayer has been heard. Elizabeth will bear a son. Do you honestly think he prayed that that day? I don't. Why on earth would he? I, don't you think at that point they'd have been scared to death to have a baby? I mean, like that time had come and it had gone. I mean, how recently, it's telling us, I don't want to get graphic here, but it's telling us that she was well along in years so that we would understand that the re reproduction process could not take place. So I just ask you, do you honestly think that old man went into that altar that day and prayed for his wife to bear a son? I do not think so. I think what happened here is one of the scariest things on earth. And that is that some of our prayers are still like out there blinking before God. When we're thinking to ourselves, I should have canceled that one. I didn't want, I should have said, no, I, I'm over that now. I want to cancel that one. I like to, they're still out there. And here's, here's what God began to show me. That we never bring, I want somebody to get this. Who needs this the most? Who needs, okay. All right, listen to me. We never bring a new request to the altar. Everybody stand with me. What did I just say? that he does not remember the old one. <laughs> oh, is that good? Is that, I mean, does it get better than that? You don't even have to mention the old one. 
Every time you bring the new one, he still remembers the old one. Every prayer you've got. There's this beautiful picture in Revelation chapter 5 where it says that they're holding up a bowls of incense that are the prayers of the saints. And you got to know with me today, they're still out there. They're in, I need somebody to say they're in the bowl. They're in the bowl. They're, look at one another and say they're still in the bowl. He hadn't forgotten that. Every one of those. In fact, if you want it out of the bowl, I suggest you go back to the Lord today. Because you might go, get that one out of the bowl. Get that one out of the bowl. Get that one out of the bowl. I mean, some of you are going to end up married to who you asked to be married to when you were eight. You don't want him. You don't want him. Go back and go get that one out of the bowl. But the rest of them, they're in the bowl. They're in the bowl. He remembers. And they come up before him as live coals on that altar, bringing the savor. I mean, like, it's one, one sniff away. Every prayer we've ever prayed, every time we pray something new, what did I tell you? He remembers something old. Every single time our prayers have been heard, and that is number three. Believe that God has heard you. Believe that God has heard you. What happens when what comes naturally to others has to come supernaturally to you? I've come just begging you to see a new scriptural paradigm. Not cursed are you, girlfriend. Blessed are you. Not, not cursed are you, guy friend. Blessed are you when what takes natural course with someone else means that a miracle has to take place for you. You have just seen something that's going to mean something to you and mean something to those around you that other people will never even get. Never even get. i got to tell you, I've got a, a friend that I admire so much, a young woman back in the Houston area who has a son with autism. And uh, he, like many children, uh, uh, with autism, I just did not speak, and it was one of the ways they knew fairly early on uh, that something was up. He came to two years old, did not speak, came to three years old, did not speak, came to his fourth birthday, and still had not spoken. And I'm going to tell you, at about four and a half years of age, I get a text from her that said, he said, Daddy, today. Oh, and I mean, he was four and a half years old and said, Daddy, listen. Nobody on the planet has ever had that much celebration take place over daddy. Nobody. I mean, you cannot imagine how all of her friends, how all of us just shouted praise to God. Other kids have been saying it all day long. We've not even noticed. But well, we noticed when this one did. Because somehow what had taken, what had been a natural course for somebody else had taken supernatural power of God. And they said, let his name be praised. Let his name be praised. What seems effortless to some, takes a miracle for others. But I will, I've never met anybody that didn't say afterwards they wouldn't have rather had the miracle. Right. I mean, really, are you going to trade back the miracle for the natural? Really? Truly? Truly? Because when it's all over with, you are going to say, I'd have rather had the miracle. I know it's hard to see now. I know it's hard to imagine now. But that is going to happen. That is going to happen for you. And it is going to happen for me. I, I think it's just so remarkable in the, in the passage that we're told that he's going to name the child John. And that that name means Yahweh is gracious. Yahweh is gracious. I want you to see something here in, in um, verse 14. It says, um, I had you look at it for just a moment. He'll be a joy and a delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth. A joy and a delight. The word joy is the word that you think it would be. It means joy just like you think it does. But the word for delight uh, is, is a word that means to just leap and dance and, and, and jump up and down for joy. That's what takes place when you experience a miracle. And, I mean, anything else might have been just thank you, Lord, thank you, Lord, thank you, Lord. But every now and then... When something that just came naturally for everybody else comes supernaturally to you and it happens. And I mean like there is dancing and there's leaping and there's celebrating and you wouldn't trade it for anything. Look back at Luke chapter 1. Tell me we made two points so far and our, our, our audience on the other side of the screen needs to catch up with us. So what are they? And I want to hear the third one as well. First one was what? We, we got to be open to a fresh encounter. The second one was? Bring our disappointments to the altar. He already knows. Part of authenticity is we just go, Lord, I'm just, I'm like, I don't get this. I'm just devastated over this. Why this? And what was number three? 
you got to believe God has heard you. we got to believe when we pray that we are being heard. Now, pick up in verse 18 and through 22. Oh, this gets so good right here. So, he, he, he gets this message from the angel Gabriel. And, I, I mean, Gabriel is an awesome, terrifying sight. Verse 18, Zechariah asked the angel, how can I be sure of this? What an idiot. Can I just... <laughs> I'm sorry, but like this dude doesn't look like any dude he's ever run into, ever, ever, ever. This is Gabriel. He says, I'm an old man and my wife, you know what he's trying to say, have you seen my wife? I mean, I get, I, and it offends me. I get what the dude's trying to say. I'm an old man and, and my, my, just take a look at my wife. It says in verse 19, the angel said, because he's asked, how am I to be sure of this? And look at what Gabriel says, I am Gabriel. I mean, don't you know, I mean, he's wanting to go, comma, you idiot. I mean, there's almost that, like, I'm Gabriel. That's how you know. I stand in the presence of God. One reason why he was such a terrifying sight is because he stands in the presence of God, and he has that radiance on him. See, he has that, that, um, that mirror, that light so shining on him that, like the face of Moses, uh, when he came down from the mountain and it just scared the rest of them half to death and he had to cover it up. Well, Gabriel's got that shiny, that radiant face because not his own radiance, not because anything in him is light, but because he receives his light from the one true God. I'm Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. I mean, he's offended. And I've been sent to speak to you to tell you this good news. And now you will be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens. That is a whoops if you'll ever see one. Because you did not believe my words, which, by the way, will come true at their proper time. Now, I stuck in that, by the way. But listen, what I love here is that he doesn't take his word away. He said, that word's still going to come true. Because it wasn't based on you. That word's still going to come true. But you know what? You're not going to say it one single word until it happens. And so now they're, he comes out. They're waiting to be blessed because he would normally come out and do... Some version of, if not exactly the number 6, 24 through 26, it says, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. He would have done all that. But so he comes out then. I want you to notice. I want you to pick back up with me. It says that in 21, the people were waiting for Zechariah, wondering why he had stayed so long in the temple. And when he came out, what, what does it say? No. He couldn't speak to him. And they realized he had seen a vision in the temple. I love this. For he kept making signs to them. So he goes out. I mean, it's like, I mean, now his face like, and I mean, by this time he's already tested and nothing's coming. And so he comes out to give his blessing. And I mean, like, he's only got a couple of responsibilities. He's kindled the, uh, the altar, uh, the coals on the altar, and now he's got to go out and bless people. Only he's been struck down. He can't say a word. So he goes out and he begins holy charades. Like, you know, like this. Like this and this and then this, you know. Is, is, any, is anybody going there with me? So he he acts out the whole blessing right in front of them. It just there's something that's just too good, isn't it? That is just too good. All right, I just got to show you. Now, what I want you to see 23 through 25. Now, it says when his time of service was completed, he returned home. After now, he returns home. She goes, hi, honey. He goes, because I mean, he's been struck down, me, buddy. Anybody getting that with me? Uh, hi, honey. Um, and he can go, honey, I'm home. He has to go, you know, honey, I'm home. And so after this, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant and for five months remained in seclusion. The Lord has done this for me, she said. In these days, he has shown his favor. There we go. She said, you know, we're all loved by God, but I'm his favorite. Um, we're favor of God and taken away my disgrace among the people. Okay, look at this. How long did she stay in seclusion? Five months. Okay, you've got to love this. Now, for any of us who have had children um, in the natural course of a pregnancy, we can figure out why it's five months. Because listen to me, again, I don't want to be graphic, but I want you to understand the timing here. Because you, she had no cycle left. How is she supposed to know whether it happened or not? Because hers took place, even though a miracle is taking place, there's still the normal husband and wife relationship here. Uh, this, is not, um, this is not Mary we're talking about here who was um, uh, given a baby by the power of the Holy Spirit. There's a miracle taking place here, but it's, it's working in the natural means of a husband and a wife coming together. And then now, so how's she to know? How's she to know when? 
And so she has to wait until she has physical evidence because the normal physical evidence that a, a younger woman would have would not be there. So she's got to wait the thing out. What happens for any of us who have done this before, what starts happening by five months? You can feel that baby move. By that time, you can lay flat on your back, and you can rub your hand over your abdomen, and you can feel that you have a little pooch. Now, picture this old woman. Please love this with me. Please love the Lord with me over what he did for her. Picture her just laying back. You know that she did it. Don't you know that she tried to wear her um, robes tight into town so people <laughs> could see? You know? Because I don't know about you, but, but in my pregnancies, I wanted people to know I was having a baby and not just a lot of Mexican food. I wanted people to know that. So I just loved it. Once I got a little pooch, I might hold my skirt back a little bit like this. Cause I want... and so, so she's doing all this. So she doesn't even go out until she knows, until that baby has life within her, until she's had those kinds of, of responses and that kind of manifestation. It is the dearest thing. When I imagine that woman going through the birth process and I imagine those tears flooding through those lines around her eyes like rivers of living water down her face. Do you think that she would have given up that miracle for the natural, for anything in the no. world? Can you imagine a more spoiled brat? <laughs> Yo! Do you, can you even picture how much they loved that child, how everything he did, no one had ever done it like that in all of the world. He was a joy and a delight to them their entire lives. I want you to take down number four. Blessed are you when what comes naturally to others comes supernaturally to you. Blessed are you blessed are you when what comes naturally to others comes supernaturally to you somebody say amen. amen let me tell you something in that verse 25 where it says this the lord has done this for me that's what he's looking for if you've ever wondered what really is glory, that we're to live to the glory of God, uh, it's the testifying that it was only God that could have done it. Uh, when we live to the glory of God, uh, we show His Godness living through us instead of ourselves. And He's just living for us to say, the Lord has done this for me. The Lord has done this for me. I just want you to know, this didn't just happen by natural means. The Lord, my God, has done this for me. That is the thrill for him on the throne. That is where we see the favor of God in the delight of his response. The favor of God to say it had to have been him. I want to show you something. I want you to look uh, forward to verse 57 of that same long chapter, Luke chapter 1, verse 57. I've got to show you this because I thought it was such a thrill. It says in verse 57, When it was time for Elizabeth to have her baby, she did give birth to a son. And her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown her great mercy, and they shared her joy and said they were going to. She just couldn't wait. There's something, you know, um, men, I don't know if you're the same as, as women are about this particular thing, but we want people to just join in with us. Like it's not enough for us to have the joy by ourselves. When, it tells, when the parable is told about the, the woman that finds the coin, the, the treasure that she has lost, she gets all her girls, girlfriends, tosphilos, it says in Greek, and that means the girlfriends. She goes and tells her girlfriends because she wanted them to celebrate with her. And it's just kind of a woman thing. It's not enough by ourselves. We want to share it. And so she shares it with her neighbors and relatives that God has shown her this great mercy. And they shared her joy. And in, in verse 59, it says this, On the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child. Now, on the eighth day was the day they pronounced the name. So throughout this time, even though they might know what it was going to be, but on the eighth day, the name is pronounced. On the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child, and they were going to name him after his father, Zechariah. Now, first of all, I want to ask you, who is they? Anybody, anybody that's had this struggle in your family over who you're going to name uh, your child after? Oh, my word. Especially if you are the first one, if you have the fortunate and unfortunate 
situation of being the first to give uh, uh, the grandchild to the grandparents, the first grandchild in the family, you're going to have a lot of pressure with names. It seems like you wouldn't, but there's just this underlying thing, and boy, was it true here. They were going to name him after his father. Who is they? It's not them to name him. And yet we see it all over. This is the family thing here. These are the relatives here. They were going to name him after his father, Zechariah. But his mother spoke up and said, no, he is to be called John. And they said to her, this is priceless, verse 61, there is no one among your relatives who has that name. <laughs> you can't name him that. There's no one in the family that has the name John. And then it says this, this is maybe the most perfect moment in this whole portion of the end of this mid mid part of Luke chapter 1 would you look at this it says there is no one among your relatives who has a name then they made signs to his father to find out what he would like to name the child okay wait a second because he's not deaf he's just dumb can anybody get that with me it just kills me that down there doing all the hand motions because all pregnancy long for nine months, he's been doing a lot of this. So they do it back, J or Z. I mean, they're doing their, so they're all doing this. Well, it says then, all of a sudden, all of a sudden, he asked for a writing tablet. This just kills me, too. To everyone's astonishment, he wrote, his name is John. His name is John. Can't you just see his face like, his name is John. His name is John. Immediately, his mouth was open. Do you know, it had to open at that moment. Because they're like, the, your mouth won't open until it's born. Well, eight days later, I mean, nothing, nothing. But when he says, his name is John, girlfriend, guy friend, that is a power of a name right there. Immediately, his mouth was open and his tongue was loosed. And he began to speak, praising God. And the neighbors were just all filled with awe. And throughout the hill country of Judea, people were talking about all these things. And everyone who heard this wondered about it, asking, what then? Is this child going to be? For the Lord's hand was with him. When that child took so much more than everybody else's, you have to ask yourself if you're a woman or a man of God, what on earth? What on earth? When a kid has gone through leukemia as a child and God's brought them out on the other side and let them go through something that we think with our rational human minds a child ought never have to suffer, then might we ask, what on earth does God have in mind for this child? If it took supernatural means to do a natural thing, what on earth will God do? Blessed is he. Not cursed. Blessed is he. Okay, what was the first one? We have four words. What was the first one? Faith. Okay, so I want to know all four of them. Faith, focus, fire, finish. Faith, focus, fire. One more time. Faith, focus, fire, finish. That brings us to number two, and it's the word focus. Uh, this one may be the one uh, you might not be expecting. And it's key to the rest of them. we got to have faith. I think all of us would understand, even if we're not doing it, that's what we're supposed to be doing. Walking in faith. I think we get that one. But focus is key here. It's key. The second one is the word what? Focus. focus. All right, look back at the scriptures when it says, in verse 5, we've been told in 4, that our weapons have divine power to demolish strongholds. And it says, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, that it exalts itself, I believe is the King James uh, Version terminology, that exalts itself um, uh, uh, against the knowledge of God. Okay, picture with me. Every single stronghold in our lives has gotten to its place by sheer focus. This will be true 100% of the time. Nothing will have a strong hold on you that has not gotten focus in your life. Because the only reason it, it has taken that place and gotten highly exalted is because we focus so much on it. Now, remember, all it takes to be a stronghold, all it requires to become a stronghold is that it becomes a mental uh, obsession of sorts. It takes up a lot of mental energy. We think about it a lot. That's focus, ladies and gentlemen. That's focus. 
So it got that way. It's whatever it is. Uh, what, an, an addiction becomes something. If you've ever had one, and I've had one, you, talk, you think about it every day, every single day. I mean, whether you give way to it that day or not, you are thinking about that day because it has become such an area of focus. Unforgiveness becomes focus. Um, bitterness becomes focus. Um, idolatry and covetousness and greed becomes focus. Um, sexual strongholds have become focus. Uh, pornography becomes a mental focus. Every single one of those strongholds, anything that has a stronghold on you, has been more and more exalted into that place by additional focus. That to the degree we have focused upon it, it has been raised up and exalted in our minds. Is everybody stepping in that with me? So that's how it got up there. So the only way it's going to come down is we got to focus more on it coming down and in the power of Christ and in the divine weaponry he's given us and in what he can do. We got to focus on it for it to come down because it's the only way. The only way we got to focus on what God's word says about it instead of what we and our own nature say about it. And that's what's going to topple it. But listen to me. You, I think we think if, if I will just not pay attention to it, it will go away. Well, it got there because we keep paying attention to it. Right. And, and we think, well, I don't want to have to focus on that. Oh, oh, yes. If we've got something that is overcoming us, if we've got a stronghold of fear and intimidation and timidity, uh, for, for instance, we have to attack that thing. We've got to name it what the Bible names it. And we've got to begin thinking what Scripture says about it over that particular thing. We've got, that's what sets it up over it, and it topples down to the knowledge of Christ. Does that make any sense to anybody? And it's a radical process. Uh, there's nothing uh, passive about demolish. I beg you, come up with a word that's stronger than that. I came to a point, so interesting, I think back on it and, and sort of want to punish myself over it, but I, 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 I have to believe God is sovereign and could have done it in any order he wanted to. But in, in my particular strongholds, the areas of bondage that I had, um, areas of addiction that I had, um, I had gone through um, my own process of breaking free in my relationship with God, and so many of those things had lost their power over me. But I somehow had never determined what the root was from which they were all growing. And it may be different for you, but God taught me right before I'm about to do the defeated thing, and I just want you to, all of you go with me there for a minute because we've all been there. So I want you to picture like you're on the edge of it, you're about to make a decision, and you can feel yourself going left. I mean, you, I, you are about to make that defeated uh, decision once again. What God began to train me to think is, what, what is the feeling you're having right before you do the wrong thing? Go to that point. Go to that point. What is it that is happening in that moment before you do that habitual uh, destructive thing? Is anybody, is anybody going there with me? All right. Well, for me, over and over, it would be insecurity. Over and over. And for some reason, something would just kind of bubble up in me, and I would feel insecure about something, and, and um, somehow uncertain and unsure and full of, of self-doubt and self-loathing, and boom, I would do that thing. It took me years to realize, you know what, I, I, fought, I fought all these battles, and God and I have seen so many um, things lose their power over me, but I never have addressed insecurity by itself. And I realized, and that's when I wrote the book, So Long Insecurity, and I'm not trying to get you to buy a book. I want you to just hear me for a second. I realized that what I had done is that I had failed to pick out the big one that seemed to drive everything else. And do you know, the Lord gave me one solid year to do nothing in my devotional life except focus on God raising his own words and his own thoughts over my own secure soul and getting that up in my head exalted higher than my own insecurities and it was revolutionary to me so whatever it is is your thing fear is it a, is it a substance addiction whatever it is there's got to come time where you decide i'm going to focus on this thing i'm going to let god I, it's taken all of this energy i'm now going to let god speak to me through his word and tell me 
what his thoughts are about this particular thing, and I'm going to see it exalted over this exalted imagination. The third one, we've got four words we're working through, and maybe some people have just joined us, so they need to know what they are. We've been in 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5, and we've got four words going. What was the first one? Faith. faith. See, we've got an anatomy of a victory going on here, and we've got four words going, and the first one is faith. The second one? Focus. focus. We've got to learn to focus. We've got to get focused on the Word of God. The third one is what? Fire. We need us some fire. We need us some fire. I want you to write down Jeremiah 23, 29. I'd write down the address, and you can look up the verse and, and write it in later. Listen, this needs to be one of your memory verses. I am a big one on Scripture memory. I told a group here recently, and then I wondered later if I would be sorry that I had, um, and I, I might be, we'll see. But I said, listen, at any given time, when you run into me on the streets or out and about in an airport, you can always say to me, what scripture are you memorizing right now? And I said, if I can't tell you, then ask me what's wrong. Because for me, God has called me to such a voracious um, uh, life of scripture memory, that has been my mental salvation. This has been my key to living in victory. This is what God used to take a very defeated mind and, and to completely rewire the hard drive of my thinking. It was through memorizing the Word of God. And so at all times, I've got me some spirals going. And I've got some scriptures that I'm memorizing. At all times, you should be able to ask me, what's your verse right now? And I hope I can at least tell you six words of it. Maybe I'm in process. But I can at least tell you what the address is and part of the scripture because it's that important to me. Now, God's word says in Jeremiah 23, 29, Is not my word like a fire, declares the Lord, like a hammer that breaks a rock to pieces. We're talking demolition here. Is my word not like a fire? We got to have us some fire. We got to have us some fire. I want you to understand something with me. A, a, a stronghold gets broken down only one way. It's got to be blown up. This, this is demolition here. Demolish strongholds. This is detonation. And we detonate that thing with the fire of God's Word. Now, something that I think about a lot, because I'm a very visual learner, and, and I love to think of things in, in ways that kind of stick with me through the process. And I, I think of it this way. I think of the anointing of the Holy Spirit. For all of us who have received uh, Christ Jesus as our personal Savior, the Holy Spirit dwells in us. And now we can quench him, or we can be filled with the Holy Spirit by yielding ourselves to the Holy Spirit. But think of that as your anointing oil, and think of it as flammable oil. So I want to be filled with the Spirit, and then when you stick the fire of God's Word in it, it's going to blow up. I'm talking about some internal combustion. Anybody know what I'm talking about? <laughs> that when I want to be filled with the Spirit, then I want to add the Word of God. Like I go to Him, I'm asking Him to fill me up, and then I begin to get in His Word. And I want to let that fire... Touch that flammable oil of my anointing. And I mean, I just want that thing to blow sky high. And we begin to detonate and demolish those um, mental strongholds. Are you in Christ? Does the Spirit of Christ dwell in you? You are not that fragile. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Listen, I'm for a good cry. I'm not talking about having a good cry. I'm not talking about just like we really are hurt. We really, I'm talking about like every day about everything. Get a stinking grip. <laughs> you, I mean, your life's going to be long even if it's short. It's going to be long. It's going to be long for everybody around you. Do it for them. Do it for yourself. But I mean, just to like be wounded, wounded, wounded. We're just wounded about everything. I mean, pull it together. <laughs> well, well, here's what God began to show me, because it's talking about divine power to demolish strongholds. And, and here is, I'm about to tell you now, the practical approach that has worked for me over and over and over again. That we, I want you to think of the word and prayer as two pieces of dynamite we're going to strap together. So I want you to think of this, and, and uh, this is something that, that um, the Life Today team asked me to explain. They were asking me, they said, you know, the concept that is in the book, Praying God's Word, and the reason why I would uh, normally not ever bring a book up, but what I love about this book, and again, I, I'm not trying to get you to get it. I want to explain to you the process in it. What I love about it is it's not my writing. It is the Word of God taken and then turned into prayer. And so what 
practical aspect is at work here is that we take one stick of dynamite of scripture and the other stick of dynamite as prayer strap it together and then we light the thing and when we do that we begin to demolish strongholds now somebody will ask and i think this is a great question beth when when you pray do you always pray using scripture absolutely not I mean, we have conversational prayer, perhaps, and an intimate relationship with God all day long. I, I never use any particular type of uh, approach to prayer 100% of the time. But I will tell you this. One of the things that God has taught me to do that, that, our, um, that our computers have given us access to do that our predecessors couldn't have ever dreamed, something I do in my quiet time, and this is not about warfare as much as it is just intimacy with God through his word, I will go to my, um, to my Bible software, I will take whatever my segment is for that particular day in the scriptures, and I will cut and paste it into a word document that is my journal. I, then I go into it. As I'm reading God's word, perhaps he says one sentence to me, and then I write back to him in the middle of it in a different color. So he speaks to me, I speak back to him. Are you getting that with me? Okay, say for instance, we've been on 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Maybe my reading that day is verses 3 through 5, and it says, um, For though we live in the world, I might stop right there and go, And what a world we live in, Lord. See, I'm going to dialogue with him. I mean, this is, this is the world around me right now. So I begin to dialogue with him back here. And it says, are not the weapons of this world, on the contrary, they have divine power. I might stop right there and talk about divine power back to him. Lord, I need that divine power. Lord, I've forgotten what that's like to see that enacted in my life. So I'm dialoguing back and forth with him. So I will um, almost every single day use scripture as a, an invitation to dialogue. Does that make sense? And so I put it in a different color. So he and I are going back and forth and back and forth. So by the time I get to the end of my prayer time, I feel like I have had a conversation with God. I even do it in whatever my devotional is. If, if I'm doing Spurgeon's devotional, I'll get in the middle of it, and I cut and paste it, and then I talk back in the middle of it. And I talk back not to Spurgeon. That would be a lost cause. But I speak back to God himself. And so in that way, having a dialogue. But let me tell you this, and this is what praying God's word is all about. When two things happen, I'm going to turn to Scripture prayers every single time. Based on the battle being long and hard some some battles may be long but they're just not that big a deal but by the time i have those two descriptions that that situation is going on and on and it is hard that's when i'm going to go to the scriptures and i'm going to search through the scriptures and i'm going to find what the word of god has to say that's going to build up my soul in that situation and i'm going to start compiling scriptures into prayers and i'm going to print it out i'm either going to take it down on my hand or I, with my hand or i'm going to uh, print it out so that i can have it in my prayer time now let me tell you why this is so important because when you and I are in a long, hard situation, whatever it is, whether it's a stronghold, whether it's an illness, uh, whether it is um, a, a constant suspense of some kind, um, a question that we have, a need that we have, a pain that we have, when it goes on and on and on, we naturally are going to lose our energy with it. Uh, we'll finally get to where, I don't know if you're like me, but I'll get to where I don't even know what to say anymore. I've prayed about it now. Maybe it's over a child that's been living in defeat. And maybe you've been going on and on with this for three solid years and you've just like worn out. I mean, I have a lost loved one that I want to be in heaven with me. I love him so much, and I want him to be in heaven with me. I want him to know Jesus. And so after a while, I mean, I've just prayed so long. It's gone on for so long. And, and I'll just run out of my own energy, and I'll run out of what to say. But what happens when we pray Scripture over a long, hard situation is that we shove the burden onto the Scriptures instead of off on our own soul and our own ability to pray because scripture never gets tired to obtain information on beth's teaching materials and for her speaking schedule visit us online at lifetoday.org 